Welcome to the Good Rookies Podcast. My name is Fahim. And my name is Nellie J, y'all. And we are Good Rookies. That's right. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Happy Good Tuesday. And guess what? It's episode 89. 89. Y'all, it is 8 and it is 9. This is crazy. We're almost one away from 90. But y'all... I'm so excited for this guest tonight. Like, this man knows his stuff. Like, legit, like, man of many talents, but he knows basketball, right, Fahim? Like, absolute historian. So I'm just so happy to have him on the podcast today. Fahim, please introduce who we got. All right, yeah, we definitely have someone who has, uh, you know, I'd say for his age, for what I'm assume, assuming, um, wise beyond his years, I like to say, the leader of the new school, <laughs> somebody who really, uh, king of content, definitely. So I'm excited that we have him on today. We got Dime Dropper on the podcast Ooh, today. Dime Dropper, <sighs> Dime Dropper, yeah, yeah. Dime yeah. Dropper. <laughs> that, <a> dime. <laughs> that was an amazing, I, I don't even know what to say. That was such a crazy intro. Um, I appreciate <laughs> all the kind words. Um, I try my best. i um, been watching the game for 17 years now which is so, fairly young, but considering some of the ages I see on Twitter, so, <laughs> more, than, more than most, it seems. Uh, that, no, but not even that. The year is like you watch the game. People oh, watch yeah. it, but they're casual watchers. Like you actually break it down to like a science. You know what I'm saying? So I call you the watcher. If you guys know about the Marvel <laughs> coming up, the watcher. That's you. That's you, Dab Dropper. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, and I always also try to go back in history, as, as you guys said, you know, try to know the most I can. Had you guys on my uh, Toronto Philly preview, so it's nice yeah, to you know man. both both be on each other's shows. Yes, shows. yes, man. It's all it's all about collaboration when it comes to podcasters and content creators. So we're happy. First of all, tell the folks where are you actually right now in the world? Where do you live at this moment? I live in LA, born and raised. Went to college for a couple of years, and then I came back and started this my own platform. So Los Angeles, everything. Rams, Dodgers, LA Kings. Shout out to my Kings are in the playoffs now. And I'm a Clipper fan, but I also have been watching Laker games since I was a little kid because we had Kobe and, you know, seeing one of the greats every night, I, I had to make sure I tuned in. And it's become a part of my life, just having one game each night, Lakers or Clippers. And so I talk about them for my show. So that's dope. That's dope. So I have one question for you. Okay. Uh, actually, my bad. I got two questions for you. First question is, who it, rank for me the LA teams rank your top five because we've had other guests come on here and everyone's ranking is kind of different but what's your top five LA teams because you're a Clipper fan so typically we have a lot of Laker fans on here so I'm curious to know where do you rank all the LA teams so top in terms five. of like so in terms of like how much I would like them to win yes that's fine okay well <laughs> it goes so the Clippers are not even a sports team to me they are like a way of <laughs> like literally a part of who I am at this point. I've made so many friends through being a Clipper fan. I've also just been known going, growing up in school as, oh, that's the Clipper fan because we didn't have that many like that. Like the proportion of Lakers to Clippers is very small. So when people wanted to talk about the Clippers, they know where to come to. So Clippers for me is, is not even – it's in a different galaxy, quite mm. frankly. Then mm. I would say – you know, I love all my, I love all the children equally. You know, the <laughs> not the Lakers though, because I obviously one one team in each sport. So basketball is my Clippers. So I'd say the Lakers fifth, I guess by default. But two, three, four, Kings, Dodgers, and Rams. It's really hard to differentiate. I like them all the same, but I will say this: the Dodgers, I would put second, just because I've I want them to win so badly because I've never seen them win a true championship to me. We won the 2020 COVID championship. It was mm. no parade. It just didn't hit the same. It wasn't here. It, and I'm not going to – like, that's the thing but, about but, – but, but at least it wasn't in a bubble. Basically, I mean, in Texas, I wasn't there. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I wasn't there. It needs to be – it needs to be – there needs to be games at Dodger Stadium. It was just – so that – I would say the Dodgers second because I want them to really win a championship. And then third, it, it, I, I can't differentiate between the Kings and the Rams. I've obviously been a Kings fan longer because the Rams moved back and yeah. I became a fan when they came. Um, but just getting to see both of them win a championship now at this point in my life with two Stanley Cups, the Kings won, and then the Rams winning the Super Bowl this year was awesome. But the Rams, you know, they got a lot of work to do in this city. It was not as you would expect for a championship celebration when the Rams won in February. It really wasn't. 
I couldn't even get anybody to go to the parade with me. I went by oh, myself. Wow. That's wild. So that tells you where's the Dodgers. If they win the championship, the whole city will shut down. So oh, I know, but I was yeah, in LA. In a lot of I went to a lot of Spanish communities, um, a lot of communities um, downtown, and they love the Dodgers. Like, oh yeah, huge. Yeah, I'd say the Dodgers are probably the most. I'd say, in terms of universal support in the city, or should I say, you know, citywide support. I'd say they have the the biggest, l- less c- contentious, because the thing is, Clipper fan base is growing. The Lakers, I think, have the most people that care about them. If you have to pick one yeah. team, who, do they, who does LA care about the most? Lakers, basketball city all the way through. But, but it ain't about them. It's about you, damn it. So I got yeah. your so one, no. two, three. <laughs> What's your four? Okay, well, you know what? I, if, if we're going to go with my choices, number yeah. five would be like the LA LAFC or something over the Lakers. That's fine. Hey, saying. that's and, and that's okay, right? It's a safe space, right? It's a safe space. Because yeah. normally we get LA fans that are all Laker fans. So no, yeah. I like your list. I like it. God, let's book it. And my second question for you, quite simple. The biggest shocker of the playoffs thus far biggest shocker one moment you can't pick more than one one moment biggest shocker of the playoffs thus far oh definitely the celtics getting so, so, that's uh, what i thought Nets. i mean that's not even a question i couldn't be- i can't believe that uh, just to yeah to get swept are you kidding I- i'd say game three game three was the one because like you know if you go down three nothing the series is over so for them unless you're the you know yeah, uh, exactly. yeah. Yeah, so we'll see. Such a Nick Nurse, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when they lost game three, I was I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is insane. I had the series going seven games. This was the series I was most looking forward to. And after game one, it, you had no reason to believe it wasn't going to go the distance. And, yeah, I, I couldn't be more shocked with that. What's funny, after the first two games, I called a sweep. I said, we're going to swept. Wow. Um, and, and not because I don't respect Katie or Kyrie and all that stuff. I just saw it wasn't that they were beating them. It was how. Yeah, like it was like, to be honest, I was like, no offense, but Steve Nash could have made all the like Steve Nash. The team wasn't good. The team could not compete because you have to get stops to beat a team like the Celtics. Yeah. And, and Brooklyn couldn't. didn't didn't have the personnel to get stops. And it was quite simple. I'm like, it's, it's math, right? It's math to win a basketball game. You have to get stopped and you have to score. Right. It's, it's two two headed swords. And I felt like. No matter how great KD is and Kyrie is, after I watched those first two games, I'm like, how how can they beat um, the Boston uh, Boston Celtics? It's impossible. And then Udoka coached Kyrie and KD last year. <laughs> it's like, come on, y'all. So enough cheat code. Um, he knew Steve Nash very well. He knew how he would coach, how he would do whatever. And last year, Brooklyn Nets lost two great coaches. They lost Udoka and they lost D'Antoni. So at the, at the end of the day, I, I wasn't shocked. I actually called a swept. After, I'm like, after the first two games, I'm like, y'all, the man got swept. So, but I was still shocked that it actually happened. But to your point, my gosh, it's crazy. How about you, Fahim, before we get to the next topic, um, the biggest shocker this uh, postseason for you thus far? Definitely the the Nets getting swept is a big one. I'm just trying to think. I don't know how do we how do we top that? You can't top uh, it, I think. Unless Raptors beat Philadelphia, I think yeah, that will and, top and, it. And, and, yeah, we'll put a pin in that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. no, but the but I'm saying like the biggest shocker would be that, right? Yeah, like, yeah, if, you know what if, I'm saying? If, but if, I, yeah, but. It, Mm-hmm. But no, I'm saying, but I'm saying, if it happens, I'm not saying it's going right. to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, an underrated one you could go with is the fact that the Dallas Mavericks beat the Jazz twice out of three games without Luka. Right. I thought maybe they could get one game, but to win two, right. go up to one without That's Luka was true. pretty shocking right. to me. Yeah. Yo, I was saying, like, imagine they don't play Luka and they beat the Jazz without Luka. That's Luka's first playoff series, winning a series without playing. So I was like, imagine that happened. But yeah, you're right. That was also surprising, too. Yeah. But I like it. Well, y'all, playoffs Mm -hmm. is underway. Uh, We're going to see a lot more things happening. When this comes out, um, a couple series will be over. Uh, Philly will be over. Denver is playing tonight. And so is... um, Right now, Milwaukee and Chicago, and Milwaukee is about to kill off Chicago. The score is crazy. So um, Milwaukee will be playing Boston, and I think that's going to be a very competitive series coming up. So Fahim, let's go to the next topic, brother. All right. So as we know, uh, bigs right now, uh, the game's changed. Nowadays, uh, if you're a big, you stretched out the floor. Uh, You're not just limited to the paint like the old centers. Marcus Cousins, he said something that is worth discussing. Uh, he made a comment saying, uh, quote, I paved the way for modern day bigs. 
end quote, which, like I said, this is really, I think it's a really good discussion to have. Um, I'm going to, I guess I'll go to the dime first. Um, what's your take, first of all, in regards to today's bigs? Oof, geez, you're going to get me, <laughs> this is going to be tough to sugarcoat it, but I honestly think I can't, I'm not going to lie. I can't stand it for one. I'm going to tell you why. The reason why I can't stand it, I think it is important and it's cool to have your big be able to space the floor. I do think though, I don't think a center needs to shoot threes. I really don't think they need to. I think it's a luxury, but I, like, for example, we have a Vitsa Zubats as our, as our starting center. He doesn't shoot threes and we get, a, we, we get by just fine. And if we want to really go small, we probably just not put a center in, but I will say this. I think that I'm always of the belief, and I think Embiid has made a good change to his game, even though he's a great shooter for a big, that I, I do agree with what Charles and Shaq say. Like, when you're a seven-footer and you're shooting threes, I mean, if it's catch and shoot, that's one thing. But when you're shooting threes, to me, you're taking your advantage away. I like when a big is around the basket, dominating and using their size. I think one of the biggest weaknesses of the modern big is, I think a perfect example is actually Carl Anthony Towns. So Carl Anthony Towns was a guy in Kentucky who I thought was awesome because he was killing guys in the post he comes into the league starts shooting jumpers threes and i'm like wow if he puts two and two together he could be one of the best offensive centers of all time and i do think he may be the best three-point shooting center of all time but it's still I, I i still think he kind of can fall too in love with that three ball and bail defenses out because if i'm thinking about it as a defender if, if I'm guarding a seven-footer and you're going to just shoot over me, I'm just going to put my hand up and hope for the best, as opposed to when you're banging in the post. I have to try to play defense without fouling. It's physically more tiring. And as I said, it makes the defense work. So that's my opinion on the modern big. I think it's not a it's, – it's great that they can shoot, but I think that there needs to be a healthy balance, and they got to know when to go to – I think you need to have the inside before you go to the outside. And I think a lot of bigs now, like Chris Stapps Porzingis, for example – is just so it's good with the outside shot, but we could switch Reggie Jackson on him. Then what are you going to do? You can't post mm -hmm. up Reggie Jackson. So that's how I feel. <laughs> but it also does change the game also. Because you think about it, if you say you're a seven footer and you're out at the three point line, your chances are you're probably going to be guarded by another seven footer. So that means the defensive big man is out on the perimeter also. So that means the entire perimeter, I mean, so the, the down low in the block is pretty much just you know, not bigs. So I think that kind of changes the dynamic of the game because now um, in regards to shot blocking, it can change people coming in the lane. It's just uh, the dynamic of the game changes quite a bit. Um, reason why I'm saying uh, DeMarcus Cousins, why I thought it was very interesting is I happen to think the, I wouldn't say the pioneer, but one of the definite, I, I think DeMarcus Cousins might be off when he says that. I think if it came from Rashid Wallace, I can okay. see Rashid Wallace is possibly being that pioneer that paved the way. But I think DeMarcus Cousins, he, there's been others before him. You know what I'm saying? Um, so anyway, now EJ, I'll go to you. I'll, I'll, I'll let you try and land something with this. But I think it's very interesting. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, he paved the way for modern day bigs. Um, I don't think so. Um, I think modern day bigs, Dirk, Dirk for me. Yeah, big paved okay, the way. Right. He's more like that's that's the that's the first big that I saw doing what bigs are doing today. Like for me, right? Uh, she can spread the floor. Um, like so for, for, for so for me so for me like I think most bigs are more like Dirk because like like, like you rarely see bigs in the paint as much. Like bigs aren't doing the post up. Like we saw cat what cat this past playoffs always in the perimeter. Uh, and B against us, it like he does do some posts, but. Like, again, majority of bigs aren't really post-paint guys. So I would say Dirk, but hey, if he feels that way, I mean, I don't agree. That's all. <laughs> well, the thing is with Dirk, and uh, uh, this is not really pushback, but whenever I think of Dirk, I don't know if he really actually really qualifies because he wasn't really a banger. He wasn't. I mean, he wasn't really no, a he's banger. He's more of a finesse big. Mm -hmm. So I think like it, it's, it, it, him having a good mid-range, him being a great shooter, work yeah. to his advantage. It's like Larry mm -hmm. Bird, for instance. Uh, Larry Bird, he wasn't a banger, but he could if he needed to go on the block. You know what yeah. I mean? I think... I but, think but, but, okay. but majority of bigs today aren't bangers. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, right. you know what I mean? Like, I think the bigs like you're talking about were the ones that we grew up watching, but the right. majority of bigs aren't bangers anymore. I feel like there's more guys that are power forwards that are bangers than actual centers. You know what I'm saying? So right. it's, to me, like, I think the modern bigs aren't 
as like we've seen it like we talked about which bigs are actually bangers that in the nba today you know what i'm saying like like Jokic isn't a banger <laughs> you know what I'm saying? i will say this though about Jokic compared to other bigs in today's nba he does get on the block though and, I, and you saw it in the warriors series like he's been and he cooks when he's there like he yes. actually has great skill yes like, mm-hmm. that's i think Jokic and Embiid have done a really good job of finding yeah. the balance in between what like fahim was saying i agree with that when a big, it's all about who's guarding you. Like when a big is is guarding you, it doesn't even have to be at the three point line, but just out a little bit further, you know, in the mid range or something. You mm-hmm. can take them off the dribble because they're laterally slow typically. And yeah. Then my issue is when you go with that when you go with small ball. How many how many size mismatches? Like the favorable mismatch these days is the small versus the big, as opposed to the big versus the small. Agreed. And I think the way we've come here is league intentions like in the mid 2000s the game was getting so physical that they were like we got to do something about this and they obviously you know tried to tamper uh taper down hand checking and all you know freedom of movement and you know we saw nash win mvps we saw the point guards just the, the smaller guards in the nba just take it by storm we've had now so many mvps that were six three or under before like 2004 how many mvps were six four or under like mm-hmm. No, for sure. Yeah, but but to add to what you were saying too, um, because like I have a few friends who work in the grassroots of basketball in the states, and I asked them about that because I was like, you know, what what is the future bigs looking like, right? And 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 a few of the coaches and trainers were saying that a, a lot of the taller youth right now they're not trying to be bangers, like they're, they're trying not. to shoot. I was gonna say that next. They're trying no. to shoot. They're trying to do certain things. So even though like I I understand what what Dirk what um what what well, cousins is saying, I just feel like the future of bigs are like we're seeing less and less bangers. Like, yes, um, I think in being a Jokic, bigs that can do both are going to be more valuable because they're MVP candidates. But I think that's going to be outliers, right? I think most bigs will be, either be good guys in, that, that can like do like a mouse turner, protect the paint, rim protect, or Rudy Gobert, or they can be perimeter type cat players, or they can do both. And majority are coming out like the cat type. I want to shoot. I want to be pretty. I want to be finessing. That's why I feel like that's going to be the future, the Dirks of, of the world. But what I've been told is that a lot of these kids, uh, shooting is number one. It's, shooting, it's not, they're it's, not it's, lying. It's crazy. It's crazy. They're not lying so, either. I was yeah. doing, when I was tr- getting trained growing up around, I want to say late 20, 2000s, early 2010s, I started to see the shift, like literally in yeah. training. So like my trainer, I went to the same clinics as like, now he's in the NBA, Spencer Dinwiddie. He would be mm. at the clinics in the older age group. And I got to see, like, you know, guys that were really serious about basketball, trying to go D1 and stuff. And you saw big men working on guard skills. What I think it's just kind of becoming is that everyone's trying to play like a guard. I think the yep. rules of the NBA favor now, since the mid-2000s, the face-up player more than the post-up player. Agreed. You know, you obviously have, like, legalized zones now, too, whereas you can kind of combat the post a little easier with that. And then, obviously, the rules for perimeter players have just changed drastically. So now it's like you're, you're trying to play to that advantage. And I think mm-hmm. as – you see it from youth development all the way to the league. And Kobe talked about this a lot before the accident about how he actually thinks that in AAU, yeah, all the bigs are becoming like that. Yeah. But he made a good point. When you look at the best bigs in our NBA centers, they're all foreigners. Cause mm-hmm. I think that those the American bigs are missing that. Look at the national team that we have USA. Who's our good center. Who's our good center? Like That's we don't true. have one. Because I remember last uh, for the Olympics, Cat didn't come out. I no, think he's like had <laughs> like, he's, yeah. like I know he's American, but he's so, like I think I, I was the, did, did Javel McGee play for the Olympic team? I think it was McGee who played. I remember it was bigs that weren't like top, like you know what I mean. They weren't top ones, but I think Javel McGee played. But yeah, That's you're right. I, I I remember there was an issue with the bigs that they chose for the Olympics because they're like. I guess the top five bigs didn't want to play for, <laughs> but but most top bigs are not um, American. So you're right, for sure. So yeah. walk with me with this for a second. Because um, uh, Nelly J, you mentioned the future, right? So think about this. If bigs are not, not just from a three-point shooting standpoint, but they're having handles, they're playing like guards, right? And it's something that's um, not from top down, but we're talking, like you said, AU, like you Back in the day, if you were like in high school and you're like six five, you chances are you're a center. You know, um, nowadays in high school, if you're six five, you're actually work is working and focused on being a guard, right? You know what I'm saying? So um, there's only so many positions in the NBA. Say in the future, like um, if you have if you have an opportunity where you're like say you're a six one point guard. 
or you're a six, five point guard or six, six point guard, you know, like I think we're in a wave of the bigger guards. I'm just wondering if these like regular size guards, the six footers, the six ones, the six twos, if they're going to find it harder to get work because you might have a bigger guard who can do the same thing that they're doing. And with a bigger guard, one thing we know is, for instance, not no, no shots, but Trey Young, great shooter, everything, not a great rebounder. You know, you might be able to find someone who might be three or four inches taller, who might be a better rebounder, and also maybe shoot the same. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just wondering for the everyday average height of like six one, six foot. I'm not going to say that they would be extinct, but I think you might have to be a special talent to have a, a point guard position in the NBA because the size. Um, height is not restricting someone to their position. Dime, what do you got for that? I've actually been thinking about that the last couple of days, uh, especially with the Nets getting killed. And then you see teams like the Celtics running with 6'4 as their smallest point guard. You know, it's interesting because people always say everybody's taller now, but it's really not that. It's the guards are getting bigger. Right. And then we're downsizing lineups overall, though. Like some of the lineups that are out there in terms of size, like you put that out there 15 years ago and they would actually laugh. Like they'd be like, right. what the hell? You're going with three guys under six, six, like six, six, like what the heck? But right. that smaller guard definitely is starting to look like maybe in 10, 15 years. Not as I, as you said, I don't know about extinct, but you got to be really damn good because, right. you know, that, yeah, the versatility of like switching on defense and all that stuff. So, mm -hmm. So I'm looking right now. It's kind of interesting. So they're saying uh, the average point guard uh, right now um, is about so the uh, as the average point guard. Oh, don't tell playing... us. Let us guess. Let us guess. Oh, let us okay. guess. I want to guess. I want to guess. <laughs> average point guard right now. I'm gonna guess is average. Okay, I'm gonna go with six two. Dime, what you got? I'm gonna go with six three. Yeah. So. <laughs> So essentially, it's like six two and three quarters because they're both right. <laughs> <laughs> that's the average guard, point guard. All right, you height. got it then. So yeah, so but, but but I mean yeah, you both got it. But that, that's that's the thing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think what's so unique about the six, because think for me again, this is something you know he knows about me. I'm all about ball, but I love the philosophy behind basketball. I like the psychology behind it, and to me, the guard that I've noticed that are a bit smaller size, like the Steph Curry's, the Fred Van Vliet's, um, even like, uh, I think Cole Anthony. How tall Cole Anthony? I feel like yeah, he's, you're right. He's a he's smaller guard, yeah. So smaller. these smaller guards have so much heart. Like their, their heart is so contagious. And when they play, it's like, it's like their confidence in themselves is just radiance, right? And that kind of energy is so contagious for any team. Um, their work ethic is typically really good. They typically work very hard. They craft like they have intangibles that I think other guards don't have that are taller because they're they grew up with the blessed height. So mm -hmm. they're not again, not everyone, but they're not as like like the I guess I'm called, you know, the, the small dog syndrome, but they don't have that like fight. You know what I'm saying? That's why I feel like the guards that are smaller in the NBA, if you, if you think about it, these guys have so much heart and drive and motivation and confidence because you have to be like to be a shorter guard or ball player in the NBA you gotta have some swag you know what I'm saying yeah so to me that's why and I guess I have a because like I'm a huge Trey fan I'm a big Steph Curry fan because I'm a he's so small but he has the heart you know what I mean mm. Freddie like so to me even though I think to your point for him we probably will be seeing um I think I think I think we'll probably see more wing players with handles um, more tools with handles, but I do think the smaller guard, they just bring intangible that I think teams like, I'm not saying every team's going to want a smaller guard, but if they draft one, that mm -hmm. guy's special here. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I feel like we will still see some, but I think they'll be the outliers. I think we're going to see a lot more bigger guards like as time goes on, but the small guards, man, they're hungry, yo. That hunger is crazy. <laughs> that's just shout out to though. Shout out to a small guard with heart, Jose Alvarado. Yes, yeah, yeah that's sure. a big one too. <laughs> There's a lot so of you know small guards still, though. If you and now that I'm thinking about it, exactly. in the NBA, like Darius Garland, like a bunch of up and coming ones, you know, this right? Thing, it's kind of I'm not gonna lie, as crazy as it sounds, even though we're we may be moving away from it, this the 2010s as a decade though may have been like the best for small guards if we're thinking mm -hmm. like dames and Fast. as I said, that shift in the game. DJ is kind of small. Yep, yep. Yeah, and, he's, and he plays the shooting guard position in today's exactly, league. Exactly, so. exactly. Mm -hmm. But but I think the small guards will always have a, a place because, again, most small guards, this, 
yeah. unstoppable, man. You can't, you can't, you can't build that up. That that's just like intangible. That's why I have a thing for small guards. So anyway, indeed. yeah, yeah, true indeed. All right, so um, now EJ, you want to go to for the culture? For the culture, we like to highlight individuals for the culture, and today we get to highlight Mr. Dime Dropper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First of all, y'all, this man, okay. Uh, is a is a content creator like passionate about not only about sports but life he creates content legit every day not only is he like us he's on twitter spaces he does his um stuff with um with who spaces as well on twitter but he has his own channel on youtube with thousands of subscribers and hundreds of thousands of views okay um we obviously we were on his podcast uh, with the preview for Philadelphia and, um, you know, Toronto series. But honestly, guys, special talent. And I'm so happy that, that we get to highlight you today for the culture dime dropper. So first of all, tell the folks a little bit of background about why did you want to dedicate your life to creating content for the masses? Well, I'd say growing up, uh, living in Los Angeles, you know, it's such a basketball city. You get to play year round like at recess, you know what I'm saying? The weather never prohibits you. That's something I learned in the East Coast. I'm like, damn, if I had lived here growing up, I couldn't play basketball every day at, uh, growing up. So, you know, that part of it got me into playing the game. And then obviously every single day at school, Lakers play one night, we talk about it the next day. Clippers play one night, we talk about it the next day. So I remember I used to always, I, I don't think I was the best student. I used to struggle doing homework, especially. That was my least favorite thing was homework. And I remember watching Chuck and Kenny and, and Ernie and thinking to myself when Chuck would always say, we got the best job in the world. And I'd think to myself, you know what? I don't want to do my homework right now because I just want to watch this game and talk about it with my friends tomorrow. So imagine if I started getting paid to do that. That would be the dream. So slowly but surely, I started kind of thinking like I wanted to go into like either like broadcasting or something involved with the game. And then I figured one thing I can do once I graduate college is just start my own show where I can talk about it. I didn't actually think I was going to get on YouTube at first. I thought I was just going to do the podcasting thing. And then somebody was like, you should get on YouTube. I mean, why not? Like you, you, you've always been comfortable in front of a camera speaking to masses or whatever. And yeah, started the YouTube channel. It took one video and then I had a following one video when we blew a three, one lead in the bubble. So if there was any silver lining to that besides obviously the firing of Glenn rivers, <laughs> I literally got 2,000 subscribers from that one video, a video in which I would never show to any girl or any guy that doesn't know me because I look at that video myself and I'm like, you were look, angry. <laughs> look at my eyes. I'm like, oh my God, this is not me at all. I'm a pretty calm, positive guy, but they broke me. That was a year where obviously the oh, pandemic, man. but you know, I got my college graduation taken away that year. I was looking for something, something positive. And for them to blow another 3-1 lead after I had literally hyped them up all year as we're going to beat the Lakers, we're going to go to the finals, we're going to win. Kawhi, I just saw him in Toronto go off in the playoffs. I just, I was crushed. So, yeah. Oh, my God. It, it, it's so interesting how people, like, like being a sport fan, it's it takes a lot out of you. People, like, like it's like you root for this team, like you defend the team. Like, it's, it, you take, it's so much energy and passion behind it, but like, but like, it's a drug, Like you can't not be a yeah, part of it. You know what quit. I mean? So, <laughs> I so, so, so tell me like, which, which uh, basketball player made you fall in love with the sport? Cause I think, you know, like, I think everyone has their first basketball moment where they're like, haha, like I, I gotta watch this forever. What's your basketball aha moment for you? You know, Funny enough, I didn't have a player that got me into the game. I think the game itself did because my uncles would play and my uncles would always like, eventually I started just playing with them. So I guess them playing made me want to play. However, Kobe and LeBron James for my era are just the guys, you know, mm. especially growing up with Kobe. And then LeBron was just bursting onto the scene. I'd say those two guys like kind of solidified it, but I'd say the game itself, playing the game and then going and watching it and trying to mimic what those guys did. That was my, that was my, why I got into it. If I had to pick an aha moment, I don't know if I can even think of one. I think I just. Was it like a, a big shot? Was it a game? Like a, a buzzer? Like, you know what I mean? Was it like maybe on your birthday, you went to a game? 
was it being at a game, seeing Kobe live, seeing LeBron live? Like, what was it that was like, yeah, like, this is what I want to like follow these guys or I want to like commit my, my time to basketball. <laughs> Funny enough. I, I don't even think I can, I can think of one. I can think of that moment for when I became a Clipper fan, but I don't know if I can think of one with this sport. For basketball. Think, yeah. 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 Special. I just think I just liked it so much. And I was I like, I want to so play. Much. I want to watch. It's funny because I think about, about that too. And I'm just like, I, I really think sports and basketball just creates friendships. Like all oh. the, all my friends that I played with in, in basketball on, on my high school team, we're all friends today. Married, kids, like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, we've created this like unbreakable bond because playing on a sport with, with somebody, it just creates this like sisterhood, you know, or brotherhood, you know what I'm saying? So I, I think sports really connect us all. Um, because we can all be different walks of life, backgrounds, grow up in different areas. But if we're a fan of, of a sport, we can always connect. So I think sports is really beautiful. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I owe so many friendships to the game. So many friendships. That's what people would say to me, like, you know, do you ever get sick of basketball? It's like, look what the game has done for me. Mm. It's always been a friend that I can go to, and it's made me friends, literal friends. So It's mm. funny, like um, – <laughs> Funny story, but I remember this guy I was dating, like he would always get mad because watching all these sports. And I said, Listen, basketball will be here before and after you, eh? This this thing called basketball <laughs> will never will, ne will never cheat on me. It, it may break my heart yes. once in a while, but but this right here will be here before and after you. So don't ever compare to, to sports. You know what I'm saying? That's just me though. I, I'm pretty extreme. But anyway, but yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> um, Dime Dropper, I got something for you. I, I, something I've honestly want to know. So first, your name's Dime Dropper. First time I heard, I was like, dime dropper. Hmm, that's dope. I got to know. Give me the genesis. How did you come with the name dime dropper? <laughs> so my name is actually Darian. Um, I didn't actually, dime dropper was never supposed to be an alter ego of mine. I, it was just the name <laughs> of my podcast because I grew up as a, po as a smaller point guard. So right. I'm really into passing. Like really, right. that was my best skill as a player. And I've really been into it. So when I was trying to think of a name for my show, I, I, I don't know when it came to me, but I was like, yo, my name starts with a D. Dime dropper is like an emphasis on passing and it's two right. Ds. Right. So I was like, <laughs> I was like, this is a perfect name. And I can, you know, obviously focus on passing. That hasn't really come to fruition. I haven't really been like just basketball centric, not passing centric. But in terms of like my personal biases to certain players, it's definitely like, like I, to me, if you were to tell me, I could watch one player live in their prime or just in their prime and live through it. Magic. Would be I, I was just going to ask you about that. About oh magic. Cause God, I, I heard, oh, hold on, he I, just it. He must love magic then. <laughs> oh my God. I literally just cause of my, everybody has, when, when it comes to eye test, you know, I think eye test can be kind of subjective in ways when you're judging players of that caliber. Cause you're really splitting hairs with some of these guys. Their skill sets are different, but all, also incredible. But man, when I watch Magic's like hardwood class, like full games, not the highlights. The highlights are incredible. But when you watch the full games, I'm sometimes I'll be like, this dude makes the right pass every single time down the court. And sometimes he does things where I'm like, it's like he's playing like a pickup game and like everyone else is taking this seriously. I, I, I think to myself, like, is this guy the greatest player ever? Like, it's actually <laughs> insane. But that's the genesis of, of the dime. And then what's funny is I actually had my real name in my podcast description. But for whatever reason, everybody started finding me from YouTube. And started just calling me Dime. And I was like, oh, they're calling me that now. And I was like, this is hilarious. I'm just going to ride with it. So now everyone just calls me Dime Dropper or Dime. And my name is still on the description for my podcast on Spotify and uh, Apple. But nobody cares. You're Dime. You're dime, <laughs> yeah, right? dime now, I guess. I go to Clipper games and the girls are like, sub Dime? And I'm like, hey, Dime. <laughs> like, Do you even want it? I was like, okay, you don't even want to know my name. That's cool. <laughs> no, it's hey, awesome. Because... Go ahead, Nelly J. No, I'm saying, hey, that's so hilarious to me. Go ahead, Fahim. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to say, yeah, I've, I've used the term, like, on my whole life, you know, dropping dimes, you know, drop that. But to see Dime Dropper, that that's a great, that's a, that's an amazing name. Yeah, it, it it's classic. And I feel like, yeah, you're Dime. Like, I know you have yeah. a name, but you're a Dime Dropper yeah. to me I'll take <laughs> and it. to all of us. <laughs> so Dime, uh, being somebody who's, you know, really focused on content, really impressed by the amount that you punch out anyone who's looking to get into uh you know content especially on youtube if you can give them even just a handful of things uh, steps or just any words of wisdom they could pass on um to help them on their journey well i would say equipment 
first, get a good microphone and get a nice, get a nice computer or whatever to, to operate out of first. And then if you want to do YouTube, I mean, I started out literally with my webcam on my computer. Now I have, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just like the camera, com, the, the camera from the computer. And then mm. I went to like an actual like webcam, but I would say just the equipment for as far as that, as far as the, the sound or whatever, but mainly more than anything, like the passion for it. If you're passionate about it, go out and do it. And the thing is, you might get discouraged in the beginning. It's going to, you have to start from scratch. Like not many people are going to tune in at first. I mean, I don't think that many people even tune into me still, but you have to keep it pushing because if you, if you, because I've seen, I've already seen it. I was told when I first started my podcast, if you make it past, like people average out at like nine episodes and then quit or something. I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah. And I've seen people start their podcast after me and just give it up. And I just could never, we're, we're all in, we're all in. We're going to keep pushing. And eventually after doing it for years, hopefully we get bigger and bigger. Cause the thing I noticed is like, once you get more followers, whether it's on Twitter, on YouTube or whatever, you get even more attention and that gets you even more chances to get even more followers. So mm -hmm. the more you build up, the more you can get more opportunities to get even more traction. So the main thing is believe in yourself and be authentic. Do not fake it for anyone. If you're not, here's the main thing I've learned also, you're not going to please everyone. I'm very opinionated with what I say. I'm very strong in my stances. And the more you deviate from that, the more, I just don't think you'll be true to yourself. Don't, and don't be afraid to be wrong. This is sports. Like we, we, you, you can't predict certain things. Like after Leicester city won the premier league in 2016, I just learned that you can never count them. everything in sports is unpredictable. So I don't take too much into people's predictions. Like, I don't think that gauges your knowledge at all. Right. You know, I love that. It's okay to, it's okay to uh, not be perfect, be yourself, be authentic, uh, be accountable. Right. But also like, it's funny because Fahim and I, when we started uh, doing uh, good rookies, um, you know, we're like, Hey, why not? You know what I'm saying? And you're right. If you're doing it for other people, right. Or for acceptance, um, you're not going to last long at all as a podcaster. You have to do it for the love of doing it. Honestly, that's the only way because like it's a passion project. It's a passion uh, future. A pa it's like a lifestyle, to be honest. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yes. So like we've been doing 89 weeks straight. Um, and so everything you said, I totally agree with you, Dime. Like it is what it is. What it is. You got to love it. And you got to be yourself. Yeah. I um, mean, also on Twitter, I mean, I don't, I don't, I would say this though on Twitter, I definitely sometimes taper back some of my true feelings on tweets. Cause I just don't need the hive coming at me. Like I just don't, there's so many certain players. They just have these cult fan bases that will come at right. you. And I don't really insult teams like that. Like it's, yeah. I don't really insult teams like that unless it's deserving, mm -hmm. but on, on, I save my like true, true thoughts for the YouTube. Like I don't pull back any punches on my channel, just the Twitter. Right. It's like, I just don't need, cause you know, one bad tweet, somebody will screenshot it and it's not about a take. It's just like, if you say something messed up or something, like it's never gone as much as you want to think it is. So right. I just don't need sometimes extra because some people will just see your tweet and remember, Oh, that's the guy that tweeted that one time. You know, I don't yeah. need that. It's funny. Like I, it's a saying that says that uh, Twitter, should, Twitter should not be your diary, but whatever you tweet out, you can't take back. You can't take back. It's like thinking before you speak, but on Twitter, like I remember, so I, I've made a few Twitter arguments and it's funny. Like, um, I would make a fact and typically it's with men, not with women. I think women on Twitter, we go back and forth, but it's never like disrespectful, but I've been name called insulted. And, and every time someone calls me a name, I'll be like, uh, okay, name calling. You know what? If you can have an adult conversation, this is over. And then they feel so dumb. They're like, no, no, no. It's like, and then people be like, wow. Like at the end of the day, I don't mind having a debate, but if you're going to call it a name or like be disrespectful, it's okay. I want only adult conversation, but you're right. You have to not go down the Twitter um, stink. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, right. it can be toxic. No, like, Twitter can be very toxic. You really very have to protect what spaces you go into. Because I've been in spaces today that were, like, very anti-Raptor fans, and I left it. I'm like, yes, I, yes, I can go on stage and, and defend, but I'm like, what, you know, what's the point of you doing that? Like, is it going to help or change how they feel about your fan base? No. Mm -hmm. So let's just... Yeah. I was going to say navigating Twitter is a whole other segment in itself. Hello. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, one thing is, is, especially since you're you're limited to the characters, sometimes, um, you verbally, if you say something, 
sometimes things get lost in translation or they don't, they don't read well. So you might, if you text it, you know, it's not, might not be your intention, but that's the way it came out. So that's why I, what you're saying about uh, you going to your YouTube to get your true feelings, at least you're saying it, you're expressing it and it, 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 it paints a better picture for what you're trying yes. to say, opposed to you having to be condensed within a certain amount of time. But um, on the way out, I just, just want to ask this um, with the new possibly take over. I don't know if it's official yet with uh, Elon Musk real quick within 70 seconds. Just give me your take on what, uh, positive, negative. What's your thoughts on uh, the new CEO possibly? To be honest, I have, I have no idea what to think. Cause like, are they going to change the app significantly? Like what's going to happen? I'm genuinely oh, no, curious. I'm, yeah, I'm for- asking you cause I'm looking for some, some guys. I really don't know myself. I have, yeah. I have no idea. I've heard that Elon Musk is going to take over and, and that's all I know about it. But, <laughs> but, 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 but what I heard he's, like yes he will own it but he's not gonna like uh change the operation like elon's not buying this to um direct twitter or this like you know what i'm saying like he's buying it more as an investment like mm-hmm. this is to fund his 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 air his, his aircraft or his spacex stuff it's not really for him to be in a day-to-day so from what i gathered elon isn't going to be going to like twitter board meetings and telling them what to do with the app he right. it, it's more an investment for him that's not, that's not what it really is okay, but i'm sure just... but i'm sure there's probably going to be some things for him because remember like he's also a business owner so he, he can be he'll, he'll be able to advertise to the masses his own right. products that he invested in. so for him it's a, a great investment for him because he can now do marketing for his other projects on Twitter. So, but it's more for an investment, not for him to actually run Twitter, but we'll see. Okay, right? I, I did hear about a tweet he's put out. Apparently it says something with the freedom of speech. So I wasn't sure if Twitter was suppressing people's freedom of speech already. So no, not really, no. but, but you okay. know, like they did ban t- Trump because you know, of the riot that happened in the Capitol. Oh, so, right, right, right. so, but, but Twitter only um, like, if you're putting out fake news, and like they flag you and they tell you to stop and you don't stop, then they'll report you. Or, oh, okay. or, or because remember, Twitter is a private company, right? It's not owned by the government. So for example, like if you're putting out like racial things or abusive or threatening people, or whatever, whatever, and they'll, they'll warn you. But if you keep doing it, they'll block you. Or someone reports your, your, your account for abuse. But, but like Instagram, like, like every social media app has its terms and conditions. So if you break any of the rules, that's it, right? So it is what it is. Okay. So you ready to close this out with that? Yes. It's absurd. But before we go, I want we guys to know that for Dime Dropper, we're going to have all the information, mm-hmm. his YouTube channel. Please subscribe, support. The, he covers I could cover all LA teams, <laughs> I would say. Um, but no, for real, guys, support our support content creators. And people of color, we love it. So Fahim, my bad. Let's go, bro. <laughs> no, no, no. You're good. Let's go to that's absurd. That's absurd. Fahim, bro. What was absurd this week? What was absurd? Drew Holiday, point guard for the Milwaukee Bucks. He played eight seconds and left the game early to earn his bonus. Eight seconds on the court, made a foul. <laughs> And said, I'm done. I got my bonus covered. Absurd. Ingenious. Uh, your <laughs> thoughts, uh, Dime? <laughs> Hilarious. Never seen anything like that before. Uh, I mean, obviously, you'd think, why not just play the game? But they wanted to two things. One, make sure nothing happened, no injury. I mean, we saw it happen to Luca, so that's obviously one thing. And then I think they wanted to play the Bulls and not the Nets. It's quite simply, I really don't think they wanted to play the Bulls. Uh. I mean, they didn't want to play the Nets. So, Honestly, so, so go ahead. No, I was going to say uh, he, so he put on his uniform, he left and he's $225,000 richer for that eight seconds. If he didn't play the eight seconds, he would have lost $225,000. What a nice way. Well, that's a good day's work. I'll tell you that. Eight seconds. Wow. Yeah. No, but honestly, like this is probably the one. Yes, we call it absurd because that's even a clause. But I get it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Milwaukee want to protect its rights, and so if you want to get the extra money, you got to play certain amount of games. So I totally get that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, I think it's ingenious because you know his agent. Remember, he makes money off this stuff too. So I'm just happy that he was able to say, "Hey, bro." We got to have you play for eight seconds to get this money. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. 
I think it's ingenious. I think it's smart. I like it when guys stick it to the man. You know what I'm saying? I love that. But no, like he legally deserved it. Eight yeah. seconds. And, you know, Drew Holiday missed quite a few games beginning of the season, right? He was hurt. And I'm happy they did it now because now Middleton's not been playing. You know what I'm saying? And they need Drew. So to me, I think it's a, a smart move. Big up to his agent. Big up to Drew Holiday. And bro, uh, invest that money, please. Invest it. Invest it. Don't spend so, it on too many things. <laughs> see, when they talk about contracts, right? Mm -hmm. It kind of makes me think, like, Contracts are all all full of clauses, right? Like, you know, all MBAs, you'll get money. All stars, like, the, you know what I'm saying? And then there's like, um, could be some type of, uh, like in, in, in this case, I guess, a certain amount of uh, minutes played is in there, right? Kind of makes you think uh, when guys are playing toward the end of the season, you know, like say, I wonder if they have a, like a, a point, a point uh, hit you have to do or a... Um, a rebound or, or assists. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And you know, when we talk about padding stats. Um, you know, it, there's a possibility. I'm not saying there is. I'm just saying there's a possibility where someone could come out and do things specifically knowing, oh, my contract needs this. So, you know what I'm saying? Fahim, they all thought. do it. Fahim, but they all do it. Like, it's actually well known because even for stats, like, even for someone to get um, a big extension or a big contract, like, for example, um, for, like, for example, Jordan Poole, right? His numbers this year matter because when he gets for, for upcoming contract, his agent can now say, hey, J Jordan Poole did all this this season. Here's what his averages mm -hmm. are. So these these numbers matter. I, I've heard of, and again, I've, I know people who are agents um, and they've said that in contracts and clauses or to get the bigger contract, you have to have a certain threshold of points, assists, mm -hmm. everything depending on your position to get paid. Right. And that's how it is. That's why people are upset about MPJ getting all that money. Well, guess what? His stats backed it up. So, hey, stat padding is a thing. Your thoughts on that dime on stat padding and contracts and players, you know, sometimes stat padding because they got to get paid. Yeah, it would be it would be really interesting. If we knew the details of some of these contracts and it would explain a lot if if, if you see guys, you know, sagging off their man for potential rebounds and various things like that. It's very fascinating to look into that. I wish we knew more about it, but that's all I have to say on that, really. I mean, yep. stat padding does exist, but the contractual side of the argument is an interesting one for sure, yep. as opposed to just personal glory. And it's there for sure. Like, mm -hmm. I can say, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know, like, for example, if you average more than 17 points as a rookie – um, the, the I think the first couple of years, whatever, I think it's 17 or 19 points, but depending on the averages, you get you 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 get approval for the extension at a max. Like certain numbers for rookie extensions are based right. on those numbers, uh, yeah. depending on the position. So it, it, mm -hmm. it's a fact, but to your, to your point, Dime, I think every agent and every position or player has a number that they have to target to, to get that money. So definitely. Nice. Dime in the house. <laughs> Great having you. All right, Nelly so J, much. let's put this in the books. Episode 89. 89. So, Dime, before you go, we'd like to give our special guest a chance to do a shout out. So, the floor is yours. Shout out to somebody else. I mean, obviously. A shout out to, yeah, anybody, yeah. To, okay. to yourself, to your anything, um, man. <laughs> well, sh shout out to you guys for having me on. Uh, it's been awesome. Second time interacting and, and recording together. Um, second of hopefully mo many more. You can follow me. You already know where to find me. Dime Dripper Podcast on YouTube uh, and then at Dime Dripper Pod on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Instagram and Twitter being the main useful, uh, Twitter for especially the main ones I use, but YouTube is my, that's my place. Like it, I would love, if I had to pick one of them to have like a million thing, I would pick my YouTube. So check that out because I also make history content there and I'm going to do a lot of that in the summer. My shout out is to actually two people. One, I wanted to say when we talked about the, the transcendent bigs and Dirk Nowitzki is the main one I think when it comes to shooting, but another one, and I don't know how sensitive of a topic is this for you guys, but I think Chris Bosch was also a really good one that could shoot Ooh. and he could play in the mid range. He could play in the low post, especially with you guys. Right. I thought he was one that was perfect for the, for the future. He, and then my, my shout out is to Glenn rivers, please. My friend, if you don't close this out, <laughs> My channel may get shut down. <laughs> so that's my shout out. Go Raptors. I'm all on the bandwagon. Um, what a great shout out. Um, a lot of people, yo, listen, I, I don't want to say nothing, but all I'm saying is that as, a, as Raptors, 
we are so proud of our guys. They're playing so well. A lot of people thought it would be a gentleman sweep or a sweep, and they did not do that. So at this point, whatever they do after this, I'm just so proud of them. Like, this has been a dogfight. I think only 14 teams in the history of the NBA have ever pushed a six-game series after being down 0-3. So these guys are already making history in Toronto. So I'm loving it. Um, but my shout-out is to you, Dime, Drapa, and Dime Drapa Podcast. Uh, you know, you're someone that, I don't know, like, I'm like, yeah, this guy's not cool. Like, we connected on Twitter. Huge fan of yours. And I can't wait to see all the things you're going to do in the future. Whatever you manifest is going to happen. So I give you, you enough positive, positive vibes to you, your friend, your family, everyone in LA. My second shout out is to Serena Williams. Did you guys know that Nike designed a building after her called the Serena Williams building that was actually uh, open today? Uh, yeah. Where at? Where? In, in Oregon. In Nike's oh, headquarters. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. So Nike, you know, is headquartered in Oregon. Yeah. So yeah. they have a campus that's the building in, is actually designed and named Serena Williams. So that's just nice. Huge. That's cool. Big up Serena Williams, man. Again, Definitely. she's a goat in tennis. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. you know oh, what I'm yeah. saying? So big mm -hmm. up to her. Um, yeah, that's it. How about you? Phoenix? Nice. I'm going <laughs> to piggyback off of Dimes. A shout out when he mentioned Chris Bosch, another big, big one from Toronto that often is not popular but i want to give a shout out to andrea bernardi wow <laughs> he was a seven footer he could stress the yes. floor couldn't really bang too much but he still fits the description and and he got killed back in that era for not being able to bang. Right. <laughs> i feel like he played 10 years too early hey what about jorge garbajosa while we're at it <laughs> oh, nice. guys, garbajosa guys, guys if you're listening okay there are a few names that trigger me as a raptors fan okay and Fahim knows this, guys. Fahim knows this. This actually name, this name is banned in Raptors, Clubhouse, and Twitter spaces. But Fahim, Fahim. Well, good rookies I is the platform. Believe, we'll give him a little I, bit of love. I, I, I can't believe you mentioned this name. But whatever, Fahim. I, Fahim, I forgive you. Barney? I forgive that, you, Fahim. That's the I name? I forgive you. That name is triggering for me, man. Barney because Arnie. Listen, okay. dime, dime, okay, dime. If you get a moment, look at that draft, okay? Look, look, look at the draft and... Keep in mind, Toronto had the number one pick, okay, Dime? So that was 2006, correct? Yes. Yeah. It would six. have been so, Mark. It would have been, I think, LaMarcus Aldridge would have been like, we could, was that it? Dime, 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 for Dime. Look at that draft, okay? Okay. And, 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 uh, and you know why, Dime, you know why. Go, sorry, sorry, sorry for him. Go, go ahead. Go, right. go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to just finish um, with my shout out is also uh, J.R. Smith. I'm not sure if anyone was yes, aware. I he see. went back to school. He's at North Carolina AT&T, and he actually had a golf scholarship. That was news. What people probably did not expect and isn't getting a lot of push, he is a academic athlete of the year. He has a 4.0. This is someone who went from high school to the league, didn't go to college, after the league, goes back to college and is a 4.0 student and academic athlete of the year. Yeah. Shout out to J.R. Smith. And you know what direction to go. <laughs> Which one for him? Which one? <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> Instead of going to the side, going up. That was, that was a shot to uh, remember when LeBron was like yes. 21. Yes. Okay, cool. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and close out this episode. All right, y'all. This is episode 89. Nice. So if you had a good time, you enjoyed yourself, please like, subscribe, and tell a friend to tell a friend for him. We're on all platforms if you're looking for us. That's Good Race Podcast, episode 89. Dime Dropper, we appreciate you, bro. And we out. Peace. Peace.